This is David Duval, and I'm proud to have at WNCN Studios one of the foremost American composers. His name is Benjamin Lees, and indeed, Benjamin Lees has been performed all over, and in this year, you are even being performed more than ever, although you're one of our most performed composers. You were 60 in January, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, but I've forgotten about it. Well, you're on, of course, to the next work, which you're always doing. First of all, let me say hello to you, and... Just tell me how you've been. Fine. I haven't seen you in 10 years, and you're looking well. Thank you very much. Uh, you always look well. And you're um, um, here to discuss anything specific or not? No. We're just uh, getting together, and uh, we'll talk about music and maybe uh, gossip a little bit. Oh, that's great. Musicians I, love to gossip. I love gossip, and I know that we're also going to hear the last movement of your concerto for orchestra, Visions of Poets, a cantata that you composed, and the second half of your concerto for brass. Benjamin, how is the, um, the state of musical composition today? I know there are a lot of composers, but are they a happy lot, and are they performed enough? Well, of course, no composer that I have ever met feels that he or she has ever performed enough. Uh, part of the problem is, of course, that we have, uh, what, a hundredfold as many composers in this century as we had in the past century. Yes. Uh, I think in terms of ratio of good works to bad works, the ratio is about the same. Mm -hmm. Except that now uh, you have to hear a hundred works before you strike one really good one. Yeah. And I'm not talk talking about any particular style. I'm talking about a good piece, whether it's, uh, you know, from uh, written for piano or written for orchestra or written for violin, in whatever idiom you wish to, to name. Mm -hmm. A good piece is hard to find. A good piece is hard to find. That's uh, a wonderful title for an autobiography <laughs> of a composer. Uh, they're, they're certainly hard to uh, come by, and I guess they always were. Um, as you said, the ratio of bad works, same as ever. And yet... How is this sifting process going on? How will we know what are the best works of Benjamin Lees and the best works of Copeland? What, what has to happen? There has to be performances. Well, there are two things have to happen. There have to be performances, and the composer has to die. Mm -hmm. Because it's only after the... Unless, you know, the composer is very long-lived uh, and, and goes on until 90. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, what normally happens is that the composer dies after which there is a reevaluation mm -hmm. of his or her works. Mm -hmm. And that reevaluation process can start and go on for 10 years or 20 years. You know, they reevaluated Strauss. Uh, certain works of his will always remain, and certain works will fall by the wayside. Yes. Uh, most recently, I think the reevaluation is still going on in terms of Britain, Benjamin Britain. Mm -hmm. Now, when he was alive, of course, he was alive to also promote his own works, conduct his own work. He died, and now this whole process sets in. You know, what, what are the works which will remain? We don't know. There are about three works of his so far, which we always know will be there. Uh, which are they? Well, I would say, first of all, there would be Peter Grimes. Mm -hmm. uh, the other would be the Serenade for Tenor, Horn, and String. Wonderful of course, I've just named two early works. Yes. Uh, I would imagine that the third one... Uh, could very well be uh, Midsummer Night's Dream. Mm -hmm. A later work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, after that, I don't know because I'm not a clairvoyant. I can't tell. Well, it's such an interesting topic because um, there is often an eclipse of the popularity of a composer, such as Hindemith. He was so gigantic during his, his lifetime, so prolific. And then after he died, well, no performances. Now it's starting well, it to... it wasn't fashionable. Yeah. It was not fashionable. Just, he died at the time when it was neither fashionable to play Hindemith nor to play Tchaikovsky mm -hmm. but these, or Sibelius. Mm -hmm. Now, these composers tend to go in periods. Now we're in this wonderful period again where Tchaikovsky is taken out of the closet. You know, uh, yes. You don't have to stay in the bathroom and, and cry to Swan right. Lake anymore. That's you can right. actually cry you can come now. Out. You don't yeah. have to be a closet Tchaikovsky lover. Yes or a closet Sibelius lover. Mm -hmm. But they will again go into decline at point X. And why is it? Because especially the romantics such as Tchaikovsky and Sibelius were so subjective that uh, the temperament of a generation changes and they can't tolerate certain mm -hmm. composers? No. Uh, well, uh, my feeling is usually the more direct 
a composer is, the more uncomfortable uh, that kind of music will make those who do not like to have the directness. Mm. Understand? Mm -hmm. uh, now, not to compare myself in the slightest with any of these luminaries, but I know simply because I know what my music is like. It's enormously direct. It has to hit me in the pit of the stomach, and then when it does, I say, that's it, that's the phrase. Well, what comes out in the music, of course, is a, uh, a spear. Mm -hmm. uh, it is aimed directly at the listener, and uh, for some listeners, that's what they want. For others, it makes them very embarrassed, very uncomfortable. They want to have a cerebral game or a cerebral piece, and I don't write that way. Mm -hmm. So I may be subjected to exactly the same kind of fate as, as uh, any other composer. Sure. Well, you are a visceral composer, and it, it does hit you, um, and you have a, a definite... Um, well, once you know some of your music, you don't mistake it for another composer. Well, that's already on the plus side. Yes. Because uh, the man I studied with last, who was George Antile, had uh, many phrases in, uh, at his command, and one of them was, he said, you know, a piece of music must have a face. Mm -hmm. And it's one of those catchphrases that always sticks in the memory. And the one thing I always try for in any event, whether you like the piece or you don't, at least it must try to have a profile of some kind. Yes. Well, I would love to speak to you about Antile, and perhaps we will a little later in the program. Right now, I want to get started hearing your music, and we're going to hear the Louisville Symphony under Robert Whitney in the last movement of your concerto for orchestra. Tell me just a sentence or two about this. Uh, it was commissioned during that time when the Louisville Orchestra was on this enormous commissioning project in the 50s and 60s, and uh, I... I can't even remember the, I think it was done around 1961 mm -hmm. or 62. So it's a uh, 24 or five year old piece. Yes. And uh, does it get performances other places? Uh, occasionally, but it's not a, it, uh, it's a hard piece. It's a hard piece. Uh, and I suppose, well, every orchestra always wants the latest piece. So this one has simply been waiting its turn again. I understand that. Well. We're going to hear it, and um, Whitney is the conductor in the Louisville Symphony, the last movement of Benjamin Lee's Concerto for Orchestra. <laughs> Thank you. 
Wonderful work we just heard, and it's the last movement to Benjamin Lee's Concerto for Orchestra, Robert Whitney, the conductor of the Louisville Orchestra in this performance. Right after this message, or two of them, we will be back. My guest is Benjamin Lee's American composer, but born in China. Tonight my guest is Benjamin Lee's, and he's a composer that... Um, was born in China. He wasn't there too long, and he came to California, I believe, right? Yes. Tell me a little bit about your early training, and especially about George Antile, a composer who really should be regarded even higher than he is. Well, the early training, of your t I presume you're talking about musical training mm -hmm. rather than formal education. You can say anything you want. Oh, well, uh, English was not my first language. Mm -hmm. Russian was my first language. Aha. Uh -huh. Uh, which used to be spoken with a very thick accent until I was about five. And then, you know, I began going to school, and they had these classes for children of immigrants. Mm -hmm. And the English classes were quite wonderful. There was no such thing as a dual language. Mm -hmm. And we had to learn English, and we learned that. Anyway, uh, I was taught piano by a friend of the family who also came from Russia, then, you know, by way of China and came to the United States. Uh, and I studied with him for about 10 years. Mm -hmm. uh, the family moved to Los Angeles, and I continued there with a woman named Marguerite Bitter. Uh, the war came along, and uh, I helped to win the war, as you can well understand. Yes. Uh, returned and said, look, I better get on to it. Am I going to be a concert artist, or am I going to be a composer? Mm -hmm. uh, having sat on the stage while Rachmaninoff was playing, I realized the standard was too high. I would never make it. Mm -hmm. Uh, and fortunately, at least the, uh, the the desire to write was overcoming the desire to perform. Well, fortunately, you had a creative <laughs> gift. One doesn't just decide, I will be a composer. <laughs> well, it, it was very scary. Yes. But anyway, I, I entered the University of Southern California, which was the closest, you know, formal place that I knew of except for UCLA. Uh, but UCLA had Schoenberg. 
California was fairly um, oh California, Southern California, happy then. right after the war was a cultural mecca, believe it, sure it or not. sure was. Stravinsky, Schoenberg, Rubenstein, R- Rubenstein, Heifetz. Christopher uh, Isherwood. Yeah. Uh, it was, you know, uh, Lottie Lehman. Huxley. Huxley, Lottie Lehman, uh, 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 Walter, uh, oh, God, my, Bruno Walter. Yes. Okay. Anyhow, so I went to USC, and I went there for about two and a half, three years. Was not happy, particularly with the music department, which I can, suppose I can say on the air now. They You're were allowed. not... Pret- uh, and uh, at that time, I was introduced to George Antile. Mm-hmm. Uh, having met him and decided we were kindred spirits and that he had something to offer, um, I said, I am going with George Antile. Now, the university never forgave me, and that's all right. Mm-hmm. Uh, Antile was uh, quite a unique person uh, with a personality which is very difficult to describe because the man was fluent. He was a combination uh, German and Polish. Yes. Uh, his German, Born in Trenton, New Jersey in 1900. In, that's right. Mm-hmm. Uh, and received musical training with Ernest Bloch. Yes. And a man by the name of Konstantin von Sternberg. A list pupil. Yep. In Philadelphia. Uh, he went to Europe as a concert pianist in the uh, very early 20s and was concertizing. Took his revolver. Took his revolver. The point is, though, that with George, you... You had to be very careful if you questioned the myth, because once we were sitting at the Hollywood Bowl listening to a rehearsal uh, with the Los Angeles Philharmonic and Arthur Rubenstein, Mm -hmm. George turned to me and he says, you know, kid, you know, kid, when I used to play, Rubenstein would always say to his friends, when George plays, blood is on the keys. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, well, listen, even if it isn't true, it's a nice story. There was an intermission, and George says, come on, kid, which was his term for me. I'll introduce you to Arthur. Sure enough, when George climbed up on the stage, there was this enormous embrace, and people on the stage said, oh, my God, look at these embracing George Antile. And suddenly, right after the embrace, Rubenstein turns around to everybody, and he says, I want you to know something. Antile was one of the greatest pianists I ever met, and when George played, blood was on the keys. Oh, my God. <laughs> Fabulous. So I realized that he was telling me the truth. Fabulous. And, of course, when I said uh, when he went to Germany, he took his revolver. He had a, a gun on the piano. I mean, he scared them half to yeah, death. He said, because you know, his the, works were then very shocking. Well, you so know, in case anyone booed. <laughs> <laughs> he scared, I remember uh, in he, his telling me, and also his wife told me, that with that revolver, he pointed it at the ushers. And he said, close the doors. The first person who gets up to leave, I'm going to shoot. And that audience was terrified. They said, who is this absolutely, you know, insane 21-year-old American, American. Who was playing Stravinsky and Copeland. And his own airplane and sonata. And his own airplane sonata, yes. Yeah. Well, of course, l- later on he became very famous in Paris. And uh, then he became your teacher. So this was one of your really formidable influences. He influenced me, oh, n- not in his own music. I have no yeah. anti influence at all. Uh, but he simply influenced my thinking. Yes. Really. Uh, he would tell me as we were listening to a work, I tell you this is a piece of, you know, mm-hmm. uh, expletive deleted. And that was his favorite saying. Kid, they're all full of, and there was the other expletive. Now, when he was saying they, re- he was a paranoid. Mm. Par- uh, I mean, his a true paranoid. Really. Uh, and I won't go into detail on that because, uh, it, you know, it isn't proper. But it, it was weird sometime. Mm-hmm. And he always had this they. Mm-hmm. They're they, getting. They they're, are after me. Yeah. They will not perform me in New York. They're getting me. Yeah. They're after me. Uh-huh. And, uh, but his, his great expression was when he said, they're all full of uh-huh. you know what. He was referring to the New York musical establishment. Mm-hmm. And he had warned me about it mm-hmm. when I was getting set to, to come here many, many years ago. He said, this is who you want to avoid, and this is who is going to have a knife in his hand. And, this is, and you know something? He was right. 75% of that crazy, of that paranoia, though, despite all that, 75% was the truth. Mm-hmm. And I came to New York, and it was guilt by association. Well, you, you didn't have it easy then. This I've in- never had it. I've never had it easy in New York, and to this day, I'm not performed in New York. Well, of course, you were just in. Perf- you were just performed no, by no, no. this. 
I've never been done by the New York Philharmonic. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. No major work has ever been played by them. No work has ever been done by the Chamber Music Society of Lincoln Center, mm -hmm. all right? Uh, certainly not a member of the Academy of Arts and Letters or the National Institute. I mean, you know, you can go on and on. New York has simply said, why don't you disappear? But unfortunately, I don't disappear. Hmm. Well, you certainly are performed everywhere. Well, you know, you I have, I'm very, uh, very happy. Listen, you know, uh, when you have pr uh, performances with major orchestras, uh, such as Cleveland or Boston or Philadelphia, it's not too shabby. Right. Now, we're going to listen to the next work that you have chosen to give us a taste of Benjamin Lee's, and this certainly is a New York performance. It's, well, it's, <laughs> that, that, the work has not been heard here, you know, among other works. Right. Uh, it's called Visions of Poets, and it was commissioned to formally dedicate the Seattle Opera House in 1962 when they were having their World's Fair. Mm-hmm. So this performance, we're hearing only the last, the last movement, movement of which this. is from the Whitman, the Mystic Trumpeter. Uh -huh. Only a portion of that. Yes, and we're going to hear uh, Del Addison soprano and the late Albert Acosta tenor. The Seattle Symphony Orchestra and Chorus is conducted by Milton Katums. <laughs> Oh, my God. 
Just heard Visions of Poets, the last movement, that is, of his cantata by Benjamin Lees, who's my guest today, Adele Addison, soprano, Albert Da Costa, the tenor, Seattle Symphony Orchestra, Milton Kadams conducting, and of course the chorus was in there too. And well, Ben, you have this ability to, to make epic music, and that certainly is wit, wit men esque, um, and yet it's never trite. You have that uh, ability. It's hard to have in this day and age, you know? Well, you try, first of all, you try to avoid being trite. I don't know how one avoids it, really, mm -hmm. uh, except that you do a lot of perspiring and nail-biting, and then in the long run you say, that's the way it's going to be, and I hope it's not trite. Mm -hmm. I have really, I have no magic formula for it. Well, we're going to continue talking about your creative process and many other things about you right after this message, if you'll wait. We'll be right I'll wait. back. I'll wait. Okay. Benjamin Lee's is my guest tonight. This is David Duval, and I am very honored to have as my guest the American composer Benjamin Lee's. This year he has had many performances, as he always has, even though they're not always in New York. I know that very recently a major pianist and such a wonderful man, Emmanuel Axe, played a large scale work of yours. Yeah, that was the fantasy variations. How do you compose, Ben? Let's get to the nitty-gritty. I'm always interested in the creative process. Well, usually the, the uh, process begins by the nature of the piece you're going to write, so that when the mind has said, let's write a series of variations, it's almost as if you had taken a magnifying glass over a piece of paper. And right now, the, the, the mind must focus, and you say to yourself, variations. Think variation. What is a variation subject? And you begin writing variation subjects and trying to work them out. Uh, some are good for one variation. You understand what I mm -hmm. mean? Some you already know are wonderful, but not for variation, for something else. Mm -hmm. A variation subject is a very particular one. Mm -hmm. It's got to be simple, but it can't be banal. It can't be trite. Mm -hmm. It's got to have at least one interesting hook, as Antio used to say. You have to have a hook. Mm -hmm. uh, and once you have that, because when, when, you hear the, when you hear the variations, let's say you have 20 variations, or I mean, look at the Brahms Haydn variations. At all times, the, the subject has to be in the forefront. And the listener says, ah, oh, yes, there it is again. You, you never get so involved that the subject is hidden, and the listener says, where the hell am I? Mm -hmm. Then you have defeated the purpose. So the, the subject must be simple enough 
so that you can really work with it and yet not simplistic to where you say, oh my God, you know, it's a piece of garbage. Mm -hmm. That's how I think. If somebody says, write a symphony, the mind switches to my symphonic track. I say, now I have to think in symphonic terms to write symphony number X. If you say, write a cantata, I switch to the cantata track mm -hmm. and think only about that. Mm -hmm. I don't talk to my wife. I don't watch television. I think cantata. That's, that's how my process How long works. does this take? You may not talk to your wife for two years in the whole process. Yes, I of... get reacquainted after two, three years. <laughs> <laughs> that's wonderful. <laughs> so everything is fresh. You once said that, uh, that you thrive on diversity. Well, the variation form would be a wonderful uh, form of diversity. It is. Yeah. It is. And, and you have to be careful with variations because once you get going and you build up momentum, it's almost like a game. Or put it another way, mm -hmm. you can't eat just one peanut. Yes. You know, you yes. can't eat just one potato chip. So you finish variation number eight and you say, oh, I have this wonderful power. I can write endless variations, which is exactly what you don't want to do. You don't run off at the mouth. Say what you're going to say. Bring it to a logical conclusion. If everybody loved it, you can always write another set of variations one day. Of course. So one has to know when to stop. You have to know. Whistler said that every painter should have um, two people working on the picture. One, the artist, and someone standing next to you to make sure that they blow your brains out if you overwork it. That's right. begin to overwork it. And yeah. always said that I should, one day he said to me, you ought to have a hammer. Mm -hmm. And I said, really, why? He said, so you can smash the hand so that you'll know when to stop. Mm -hmm. When to stop is one of the most important elements in making art. There's another one, though, David. Not only when to stop, when to tear up something. And that's not easy sometimes. That, well, I do it all the time. Because there I, can be some wonderful moments that you don't want to give up. You have to be very critical to it's make... It's not... No, listen. Nothing is handed down from Mount Olympus. Uh, if you really feel deep down, and nobody... You can't fool yourself, really. Ah, you're right. Because when you try, that's when the work falls on its face. You can, you can look at a movement, and if, if it doesn't fit, you've got to have the courage to say, look, I put in a month or two months and just tear it up and begin again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that does is. take courage because that's a lot of time into uh, something. It's a lot of time. But Bra uh, Brahms was a great example of the, of the terror up. Tovey once said that what he burned was probably enough to make another great composer's output. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Well, when you composed your concerto for brass choir and orchestra, which we are now going to hear the last movement, am I right? Yes. Well, you know, it's, it's all in one movement, but uh -huh. there are two, there's a separation. Did you just put on the uh, button that said, now I must move into my brass choir track with orchestra? Yes. That's in other words, uh, I hadn't been thinking in terms just purely of brass for years. Mm -hmm. When you write an orchestral piece, the brass is there. But to feature the brass, that's another dimension entirely. And uh, I had almost forgotten what it might be like to write for, you know, the, the Eduardo Mata said, yes, you could write. The genesis was that because it was a string quartet concerto and a woodwind quintet concerto, Mata said, why don't you complete the trilogy and write for brass? So I was going to write for a brass quintet. Mm -hmm. for, Mata said, look, you do anything you like, but let me give you another suggestion. Uh, you might even receive more performances this way. He said, why don't you think of the entire brass section? The moment he said that, I mean, he opened uh -huh. up the vista. Oh, it's wonderful. So there is no, uh, there's brass and strings and percussion. Only three flutes uh, serve uh, for the woodwinds here. Well, we're going to hear now this part of your concerto for brass choir and orchestra. And the conductor of the Dallas Symphony is Eduardo Mata. Thank <laughs> you.
just heard Benjamin Lee's Concerto for Brass Choir and Orchestra, the Dallas Symphony, conducted by Eduardo Mata. And right after these words, I will be back with some concluding sentences with Benjamin Lee's. I am back, and it's been a great pleasure, Benjamin Lee's. It's been a pleasure for me. I haven't seen you in such a long time. More than that, I haven't heard your music in a while, and it's just been wonderful sitting here listening to it with you. And Thank you. And I wish you the best of luck, and I know you will have it. Thanks for coming. It was my pleasure. Thank you, David. My guest today, Benjamin Lees. This is David Dubal. Thank you for listening.